All right. Let's get started. Ooh, I didn't check my markers beforehand since this was already up here. Hopefully they're good. Uh, let's see. Recap with what we finished off with last time. Last time we ended our uh, doing a little bit of a deep dive into arithmetic and theorems of arithmetic and the uh, oh, that wasn't too bad. The axioms of arithmetic. We went through the process of proving some theorems and constructing some definitions. And today we're focusing now explicitly on a theory of definitions. But before we do this, let's just recap really quick the four major components of every axiomatic system. The whole point of building up, not the whole point, a major reason to build up this whole system of propositional and first order predicate logic with identity is to give us foundations to construct axiomatic systems. That's one of the major things it's most useful for, constructing these axiomatic systems. So it's important that we have a notion of what axiomatic systems are. I told you every axiomatic system is composed of four things. Remember what those four things are. The axioms. That's good. Axiomatic system has axioms. Axioms, definitions. And four. One more thing. What's that? The undefined terms or the primitives. Primitives are undefined terms. Sometimes I'm a little worried about calling them undefined terms because they're not necessarily terms. They could be operators or, uh, yeah, undefined symbols would be a good way to say it. But your primitives, your primitives that aren't defined. If a primitive isn't defined, like in arithmetic, what were our primitives? We had plus. We had times, uh, less than, less good, zero and one. Zero, one. Those were all our primitives. That was an operator, that was an operator, that was a relation, that was a term, that was a term. These were all our primitives. Now, they're primitives. Does that mean that they're meaningless? But we can't define them. So how are they meaningful if they're undefined? How do we have some notion of what they mean? Are they meaningful? How do we know what they mean then? The axioms are what give them their meanings. Yeah. The axioms tell us how all these different primitives are associated with each other and how they relate to one another. And all our definitions from there on out are just in terms of these things. You never actually need a definition. I never need to use the symbol two. I could always and forever just use 1 plus 1 instead. There's no reason I ever need to use that thing. Couldn't you define multiplication through addition? Couldn't you define multiplication through addition? Yeah, what's the better definition? There, uh, strictly speaking, if you just start with the axioms on the real numbers, no. Now, I know what you're thinking there. You were told as a kid, multiplication is just like addition, but faster. Right? Something to that extent. And you can, when you, so there's two ways that you can do arithmetic. You can take the axioms like we did last time and just go from there. Perfectly valid way to do it. There's nothing wrong with that. Another way you could do it is you can start with what we call set theory. And we can start with the axioms on set theory, and then we could construct the numbers, 0, 1, we can construct a function called addition, and we can construct a function for multiplication. And in that scenario, we could use our setup for addition to help us define multiplication. And we could do it that way. So that kind of steps into what set theory is a little bit. We have all these different fields of mathematics. So for example, the two that you guys are most familiar with, you have algebra, which is basically using the same axioms that we've been talking about. And then another field that you're familiar with is geometry. And then one that we just barely finished last time, you know, we did computation theory. So here's three different fields of mathematics. Not all that related. And they each have their own foundations. Sad theory is kind of like finding the common foundations amongst all of math. And so a lot of the times what our axioms here 
can actually be constructed or proven from axioms down here. No. Every field of math can be built on top of set theory. It is always valid. If you're, using, if you're doing algebra, you can use sets. If you're doing geometry, you can use sets. If you're doing computation theory, you can use sets. Now, you may, in developing your field, have to introduce new axioms. So set theory won't give you your entire field. So for example, if we were doing real analysis, we would still have to introduce the completeness axiom. So we'd be able to construct 0 and 1, and we'd get trivially that 0 is not equal to 1. That doesn't need to be an axiom. And we can get that from set theory. So just to give you some intuition for how this works, the set theoretical definition of 0 is just the empty set. The set theoretical definition of 1 is the set containing 0. Or in other words, it's this. The set containing the empty set. The definition of 2 in a set theoretical way, is the set containing 1 and 0, which looks like this. The set containing 1, comma, and 0. OK, there's 2. And I can define 3 and 4 and 5. And any bi you know how a relation, those of you who took discrete math, is just a set of order pairs. So you know how I could define that with sets. Uh, this any uh, operator you can think about as a function that takes two numbers and spits out one number. So it's just a type of function. All functions have a set theoretical definition. And so you see how you could define all these things now in terms of sets. Set, 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 sets. Every mathematical object can ultimately be defined in terms of sets. And we'll see some of that when we start developing set theory. Does set theory have primitives? Yes. Right. Set theory has, yeah, that's a primitive symbol. Uh, the primitives in set theory are sets, and then the is a member of relation. Nope, we'll define union. We can define union. We can define intersection. We can define subset. We can define set equality. The only two primitives in set theory are sets. There's no definition of what a set is. And then is a member of. There's no definition of what a member of is. And that's a relation. So we say set A is a member of set B. Yeah, the brackets there, that's just a notation that we use. It's not really a primitive symbol the same way that 0 is a primitive symbol or 1 is a primitive symbol. It's just an accepted notation on how we're going to represent our sets. How you draw the set is important. The set is the undefined term. The fact that I write 1 this way versus I write 1 this way, okay, that's completely irrelevant. It's just a sim. It's the notion of 1 that's a primitive, not necessarily the actual picture thing that we draw. That's just some symbol we use to represent 1. So this will be some simple things that we use to represent sets. But the set is a primitive, not the curly bracket thing by itself. That makes sense. Parentheses, we can always use parentheses, and we have this understanding of what parentheses mean in associating things together. Because a parenthesis is a symbol that we use all the way back in logic. Yeah. So it's way more fundamental than set theory. No, it's not. No, logic does not have primitives. We we write out our rules for deductive reasoning, and that dictates what we can do in logic. And we're just basically doing an analysis of, analysis of that in logic. That's pretty much what we've been, I guess you've got here later. That's what all the earlier classes are. Logic? Yeah. Like yeah, all the stuff you missed. I, don't think, I, that much. I think this is like our 11th class, 12th class. I don't know. Anyways. So that's our review from last time. <laughs> and now we'll start the theory of definition. Nice, clean slate start here. Not going to depend a lot upon previous stuff that we've talked about. OK, so theory of definition. And we're going to start with Aristotle's notion of definition. Again, those of you from uh, philosophy, you understand that Aristotle's the father of logic. He's the one who first laid all this stuff out. So he's the first one that laid out uh, a full theory of what a definition is. So we're going to start with his, and then we build upon it. 
So let's start by understanding it the way Aristotle talked about, and this is exactly the same stuff we talked about in philosophy from those of you who are there. All right. <clears throat> so with Aristotle's notion of definition, there's a thing's essence. A definition gets at a thing's essence. The definition, every definition is associated with a species. When you define something using Aristotle's terminology, you're giving a species. The way that you define the species is you state its genus, and then it's differentiating characteristic. And its genus, together with its differentiating characteristics, gets at the essence of that thing. And that's how you define a new species. So for him, genus and species, they're relative terms. The same way that uh, parent and offspring are relative terms. Parent being like genus, offspring being like species. Am I parent or am I offspring? Uh, depends. I'm the parent of some people. I'm the offspring of other people. So when we talk about square, square can in one sense be a species and in another sense be a genus. So let's give an example of this. Uh, what did I say here? Genus is a relative term? Yeah. Oh, I'm not sure if I said this. Let's start with what we have written here. We define a species by stating its genus and its differentiating characteristics. And that gets it has to get what the essence of what something is. So no, genus is a relative term. I already tried to explain that. So let's give some definitions. And you'll notice that outside of basically rigorous math and maybe some rigorous physics, the Aristotelian notion of definition is what everyone uses. It's good enough for most cases. We don't care about that much rigor. So there's a reason that we start with what Aristotle does, because if you went and opened your chemistry book, you're going to notice it gives Aristotelian definitions. And that's what it does. So Aristotle is almost good enough. It's just if you're getting real technical, we can start to poke some holes in it. And then we're going to fill in those holes. That's essentially what we're doing. So that's why I'm going to spend so much time on Aristotle's version, because it's pretty mainstream and still used. So here are some definitions that you can find more mainstream definitions. We start with an equilateral triangle. This is a species we're defining. We need to give its essence. What's an equilateral triangle? A triangle with all sides equal. Triangle is our genus, and all sides being equal is a differentiating characteristic. Genus, species, differentiating characteristic. And we can repeat the, pro repeat the process. We say, okay, but what was a triangle? Well, here's the definition of triangle. What's a triangle? It's a polygon. There's its genus with three vertices and three edges. There's its differentiating characteristic. Genus, differentiating characteristic, gets at the essence of what this thing is. We just defined a new species. Repeat and repeat. We can now define polygon. What's a polygon? It's a plane figure described by a finite number of line segments enclosed in a polygonal chain. A closed polygonal chain. So a polygonal chain, you can think about that as a bunch of line segments all touching each other at vertices, and the chain has to close back in on itself. That's what a polygon is. It's a type of plane figure. It's the same no, because a polygonal chain has its own definition. It just happens to use a similar word in there. A polygonal chain, I mean, it doesn't really matter what exactly it's saying, but a polygonal chain is a bunch of line segments where the next line segment always starts where one terminated. This is a polygonal chain. So a closed polygonal chain is one that goes back where it started. Now notice that I kept this all, this polygonal chain, all in this plane. I could have had my polygonal chain come out here, da, 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 and then back where it started. That would have been a closed polygonal chain, but that wouldn't have given me a polygon. Because it has to be a plane figure, so I have to keep it in the plane. Okay. And we can go on defining up and up and up and getting higher and higher level genuses. Again, if. Exactly. Eventually you come to some sort of stopping point. We'll do an easy one with a person, a person that's a man. And you could define a man in terms of a, doesn't matter how, where you want to start from. We can say a man. Homo sapien is a type of sapien. It's a sapien with some differentiating characteristic. What's a sapien? It's a great ape with some differentiating characteristic. 
What's a great ape? I don't know. Does it go ape? I think I think apes are split into great apes and lesser apes. Okay, so it's an ape with some differentiating characteristic. What's an ape? It's a mammal with some differentiating characteristic. What's a mammal? It's an animal with some differentiating characteristic. What's an animal? It's a living thing with some differentiating characteristic. What's a living thing? It's a substance with some differentiating characteristic. What's a substance? There's all, he says, you stop there. Remember Aristotle had his 10 categories. Oh, yeah, that's right. Those are your 10 genuses that everything will ultimately go back to, and you can't get above them. So they're undefined. So you can't define substance. It can only ever be a genus. It can't be a species. Definitions of words. Yeah, if you're ever defining a physical thing, you'll always come back to substance. Well, substance like doesn't have that. Correct. Not like an axiom. <laughs> More like a primitive. I don't know, because that's getting into talking about things in the real world, and so it gets kind of empirical. Anyways. So that's his notion of definition. Hopefully you got a good sense of definition there. So Aristotle gave us four basic rules for definition that you have to follow when you construct this definition. So one, a definition must give the essence of the thing. It's not enough that it's always true of the thing and true of that thing and that thing only. It must get at the essence of the thing. Let me give you an example. The definition that he took issue with was one, can't remember who gave the definition, but they define man as a featherless biped. And the joke was that someone plucked a chicken and said, Behold, man. So, while it may have been the case when someone said that, that the only featherless bipeds out there were men, that doesn't make it a valid definition. It didn't get at the essence of the thing. So that's what he means by it must give the essence. Second, it may not be circular. Uh... One funny one in pop culture right now, Matt Walsh, if you know him. He goes around asking people, what is a woman? And what's the most common answer he gets? It's a person who identifies as a woman. And he asks, identifies as what? A woman. What is that? <laughs> a person who identifies as a woman. <laughs> circular definition. Doesn't get you anywhere. So it may not be circular. Third, it's stated in the positive. You can't tell me what it's not. You have to tell me what it actually is. And then finally, it's not figurative or obscure. That's the verbiage the author used. If you remember going back to Aristotle, your definition had to be univocal. It cannot be equivocal. As we talk about one and only one thing, univocal, a single thing, uni one. Equivocal meaning ambiguous or could mean possibly more than one. Okay, so those were our four rules. I gave examples of breaking each of these rules. Man, a featherless biped. That breaks that. Oh, woman. Anyone that identifies as a woman. Okay, circular. A uh, force, a non-kinematical notion. That doesn't tell me what a force is. And then uh, this obscure one. Beauty is eternity gazing at itself in a mirror. Oh, for sure. Use that in a proof. <laughs> All right, bunch of nonsense. Okay. And then question, are Aristotle's rules enough? That yeah, sure sound good. What's he missing? It's not obvious what he's missing. So I'd be surprised if he could just get on the fly like that. If you could, he probably would have and fixed it. <laughs> so... Following these rules now, we're going to create a definition, and we're going to see how it's a bad definition. It leads us in trouble. We don't want this type of definition. So here's a definition I may create. This is, uh, imagine that we have our system of arithmetic from last time, and I'm going to add a new definition to that system. So we can use arithmetic. Okay. All right, so here's what I'm going to define. That's not a times. That's meant to be an open circle, like the composition sign. Circle. X circle Y. I want to define some new operation x circle y equals z. I'm going to say x circle y equals z if and only if x is less than z and y is less than z. Okay? Defining some new operation. 
Now, on the surface of it, what could possibly be wrong with that definition? Well, let me write over here. Uh, let me write down here what our definition for plus was. So you can see the symmetries here, or for subtraction, sorry. We said x minus, let me use the same symbols there, x minus y equals z. This was our definition of arithmetic. If and only if x is equal to y plus z. This was our definition for subtraction. We define it in terms of addition. Well, now I'm defining circle in terms of the less than. Well, let me give you another valid definition. I could say x less than or equal to y. We could define that to be x is less than y or x equals y. And that's a perfectly valid definition. That's because this is a relation I'm defining. Yeah. Up here I'm defining an operation. Oh, I see what you're saying. Uh, I can't think of one on the fly to do what you want. I, I better not try. I might make a mess. But anyways, you see how it has almost identical structure with this, almost identical structure with this. This is a perfectly good definition. This is a perfectly good definition. I'm telling you right now that this is a terrible definition and we can't use it. Why can't we use it? And it's not because it breaks any of these rules. It gets at the essence of what we want to mean by that thing. It's not circular in any way. It's stated in the positive. You got the right idea. You got the right idea. So, let's play with the symbol and see what we can do with this. So observe that 1 is less than 3, and observe that 2 is less than 3. Now, what does it mean for x circle y to equal z? That means x is less than z and y is less than z. So since 1 is less than 3 and 2 is less than 3, then 1 circle 2 equals 3. Right? Similarly, observe that 1 is less than 100 and 2 is less than 100. So 1 circle 2 equals 100. And now it's basic logic. 1 circle 2 equals 3, 1 circle 2 equals 100, therefore 3 equals 100. But we know 3 doesn't equal 100. Well, the heart of what we hate about this is it enabled us to prove something that before we couldn't prove. If I don't give you this definition and I say, Levi, prove 3 equals 100, you're going to have one heck of a time. In fact, you're never going to do it. But then if I give you this definition, you're now able to prove this. So you're able to prove something that you weren't able to prove before. In particular, you're able to prove something false that you weren't able to prove before. Because we know that this can't be the case. Because if 3 is equal to 100, da 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 da, I'm eventually going to be able to show that 0 is equal to 1. Contradiction. So, bad. We don't want these types of definitions that enable us to prove things that used to be impossible to prove. A definition should no way add to your theory. You shouldn't be able to prove things with your definition that you couldn't prove without your definition. Your definition is just a shortcut for it. Instead of having to say all this, you can now just say this. Instead of having to write 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1, I can write 6. Yes, an axiom is constructive. It actually gives you new things that you can prove. If we got rid of one of our axioms, a bunch of the theorems that we proved last time, we suddenly wouldn't be able to prove. So the axioms actually enable you to prove new things that you couldn't prove before. Definitions should not do that. They should not be constructive. And they definitely shouldn't be able to make you prove something that we know is false. Okay. 
So there's a problem with that definition. So the two criteria that we want every definition to follow is first off, we want it to be eliminable. You should be able to get rid of the definition and not have it change your system. I should never have to use the symbol 2. I can always just use 1 plus 1. If you had some big proof, I could do a find and replace everywhere you use a symbol 2 and replace it with 1 plus 1 and we're good. It doesn't change anything. Right? Yeah. That's how all definitions should be. Ultimately, you should be able to eliminate it. You should be able to go back and rewrite your entire proof just using straight up your primitive symbols that you started with. That's what we mean by eliminable. Second, it should be non-constructive. That's what we were talking about before. You shouldn't be able to prove things with the definition that you couldn't prove without the definition. Okay, so that's my way of saying it. Now we'll give the author's way of saying it. So the criterion of eliminability. A formula S introducing a new symbol of the theory. Uh, theory here and axiomatic system, they're saying the same thing. So a symbol of the theory is the same thing as a symbol of the axiomatic system. Zero is a symbol of the theory of arithmetic. Because we use words in a lot of ways, <laughs> and the notion of an axiomatic system is much later than a bunch of bodies of knowledge being developed. A rigorous notion of an axiomatic system is happening after even Newtonian mechanics is up and off the ground. So Newtonian mechanics was going well before we had completely rigorous notion of axiomatic systems. And so we were already talking about things like uh, Newton's theory of gravity or whatever. Or Newton's theory of mechanics. But now, strictly speaking, whenever we talk about any theory, any systematic body of knowledge, we're talking about an axiomatic system. Or some combinations of axiomatic systems. Nowadays, when you're talking about Newtonian mechanics, you can also use calculus, you can also use geometry, you can also use set theory, you can also use, those are all the axiomatic systems that's built on top of. And so the theory is understood to include all that. So in the, mod, uh, in the strict sense of the word now, theory, a theory refers to either an axiomatic system or some combination of axiomatic systems. And so the author uses it in that sense of the word here. So, a new symbol of the theory satisfies the criterion of limitability if and only if, whenever S1 is a formula which the new symbol occurs, in which the new symbol occurs, then there exists S2 such that S2 is a formula without the symbol, and with S, with the new definition S, S1 is logically equivalent to S2 is derivable from the axioms and the previous definitions. So we're saying, with our new definition, so S here is what's introducing our definition. S is something like uh, this. S is something like this. So S is something introducing our new symbol, subtraction. Then for any time you have S1, which is writing some formula that uses that new symbol. That could be something like uh, a equals 3 minus 5. Okay, that's using the new symbol. Then there better be some logically equivalent way we can write this without using the new symbol. Namely, a plus 5 is equal to 3. These are logically equivalent. One has the new symbol, one doesn't. So that's what he's saying here. For every formula S1, which introduces a new symbol, like this, there has to exist some other formula S2, logically equivalent to it, that doesn't use that symbol. That's what we mean by it's eliminable. I can take that and always replace it with that, and we're good. So our definition implies that these two things are logically equivalent, as long as we're still able to use all the other axioms and definitions that we built in our theory. Then we can prove that these two things are logically equivalent with that new definition. And so using arithmetic, 
If I gave you this definition, you should be able to prove that these two things are logically equivalent. That would be a pretty trivial proof. You take that, use the definition, you got that. You take that, use the definition, you got that. That's what we're saying here. With the new definition, you should be able to prove if the new definition, if you have the new definition, then those two lines are logically equivalent. I don't know, am I overstating this or is it slowly sinking in? Yeah, definition is just a, a compact way of writing something. Yeah. It's like when you have some big chunk of code and you throw it in a function somewhere. And now that new function is like its definition. And you can throw that new function wherever you want. And it would be logically equivalent to just plugging in all that code instead everywhere that you did it. So yes, that's exactly what a definition does. Okay. Are we good on the criterion of eliminability? Yes. Okay, let's move on to the next one. The criterion of non-creativity. S, remember now, S again is a formula introducing a new symbol. It's like this whole thing. Here's an example of an S. S satisfies the criterion of non-creativity if and only if there is no formula T in which the new symbol does not occur, such that with S we can prove T. Okay. That's what he's going to say here, continuing it how he says it. So S satisfies the criterion of non-creativity if and only if there is no formula T in which the new symbol does not occur, such that S implies T is derivable from the axioms and previous definitions, but T by itself isn't. So in other words, looking back up here, 3 equals 100 would be our t that we're talking about down there. Here's our t, 3 equals 100. You could not prove this. Well, first off, no, does that have the circle symbol in it? When we introduced the circle symbol, we were able to show this. Here's our t. So it's a formula in which the new symbol does not occur. Like my mic. We could not prove this before, with this definition, we are now able to prove this. So the definition was creative. We want it to be non-creative. Oh, I think I gave that example exactly right here. Example, if S is equal to that definition that we have up there, and then T equal to 100, is our example of T. Get rid of that. So S satisfies that criterion. If and only if there is no formula T, there's a formula T, here it is, in which the new symbol does not occur such that S implies T is derivable. Yep, it was derivable from the axioms in previous definitions, but T by itself was not, and T by itself was not. Good? All right. So those are the two criteria that we want to make sure we satisfy when we come up, for our, come up with our rules of definition, those are the two gotchas that Aristotle didn't quite catch. All right, so let's now go over our rules for definition. Now here, what are the types of things we define? The only types of things we define are either new relations or new operations or new constant symbols. Those are the only three things we define in these systems. So every definition is defining one of those three things. Okay. Make sense? So we just need rules on how to define those three things. So here's our rules for defining a new relation. An n place relation, that's a relation that takes in n terms. Let's remind ourselves, very high level, what a relation is. Oh, let's go back to this. Back to basic logic. We have a proposition and a predicate. What's a proposition? Something that's true or false. The statement is a type of proposition. There are propositions that aren't necessarily statements. Proposition, something that's either true or false. A predicate. A proposition valued function. 
So it eats up some number of terms, it spits out true or false. And I just realized I called this relation rather than a predicate. Sorry. A relation is a type of predicate. A relation is a predicate that takes exactly two terms. Now, I'm not sure here if I followed the author's notation or if he put a predicate here. So an n place relation is just a predicate that takes n terms. Same thing. Sorry, switching the terminology there. But I think the author did that. So well, maybe he's just trying to get you comfortable with that. If you, a relation is typically used for two, and then if you want to specify some number of terms, I think it's more common in higher maths to say an n place relation than it is to say a predicate, an n place predicate. But they are saying the exact same thing. Up till now, we've just been using relation for a specific type of predicate. Now, in general, what's a predicate? It's an n place relation. Predicate, n place relation, same thing. Okay. So we're defining a relation, something is, that ultimately is going to spit out true or false. So an n place relation, P, which takes n terms, x1, x2, dot, 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 xn, is logically equivalent to some formula S, is defined, is well defined, if and only if these three rules are satisfied. Rule number one x1, x2, dot, 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 xn are all distinct variables. I can't pass the same variable in more than once. So if I tried to say some function f of x, x, z equals x squared plus z, that is not a valid way to write the function. That's valid, and it's a function that only takes two terms. Same thing here. So those all have to be distinct. You can't pass in the same variable more than once. Number two, S. The way we're defining this new predicate, the way we're defining this new relation, has no free variables except the variables given over here. Uh, no, you can. They just can't be free variables. They have to be bound variables. What's the difference? I could come up with the loved predicate. So, or the loved relation. So we come up with the loved relation. Uh, we'll throw it over here. We come up with the loved relation, and it takes a single person, and its job is to answer the question, is this person loved? What would it mean for that person to be loved? It would mean that there exists some other person, there exists y, such that y, we already used L, sugar. We'll use O, because why not? Such that y loves x. That's what it means for x to be loved. There exists someone who is in love with him. So we introduce a new symbol over here, y. This is our s, by the way. So I just defined a one-place relation. Notice x was a free variable over here, but that's okay because x shows up over here. y was not a free variable, but that's okay. Or y is not a free variable. y shows up over here as a variable, but since it's not a free variable, that's okay. And so this is a valid definition. It doesn't break any of the rules. On the other hand, if I would have said, what does it mean for x to be loved? It means y is in love with x. Now that's a bad definition. Where did that y come from? Oh, y is just a free variable. I know nothing about that y. I don't know how to use that y. I don't know what that means. So when I put the there exists a y such that y is in love with x, then it makes more sense. So when you use quantifiers, it makes it out? Oh, yes. Sorry. Okay. A free variable is a variable. Yeah. Quantifiers bounds the variable. And if it's not bound, it's free. If any occurrence of it is not bound, it's free. Because the variable can show up multiple times. Because I could have said this, or y equals z. Over here, the y is no longer bound by this thing, so now y is a free variable again. Z is also a problem. Or y is equal to 2. Okay.
Uh, these are more precise rules. So we're throwing Aristotle's rules in the garbage and starting from scratch. But you'll notice how this kind of structure is not something that's required in a chemistry definition. They're content just using this much structure. And it's good enough. Could they be? Yes. They could be. Theoretically. Yeah. Theoretically. Yeah. It gets hard seeing some... Because I, I, I can't tell you the foundations of chemistry off the top of my head. Talking about even uh, Newton's laws precisely can get pretty wordy. And it requires you to already have a lot of notions. Like Newton's first law, what's Newton's first law? Most people say uh, an object in motion remains in motion unless acted upon by a net force. If you were to state that explicitly, first off, that's not even the first law. The first law is that there exists some reference frame such that in that reference frame, this is the case. So you need an existential quantifier, some way of talking about a reference frame. That needs to somehow be plugged in there. Such that, and then talking about the net forces on it, summing to zero, implying that its uh, acceleration is zero. So you come up with a way to write that one out. But by the time you get to foundations of chemistry, I have no clue what all the basic assumptions are and how hard it would be to write it all out explicitly. Right, so with Aristotle's notion of essence, it's something that you can't remove from the thing. So Aristotle defined man as a rational animal. So in, a, in essence, a man is an animal, and a man is rational. And you can't magically take those things away from him. The fact that he has two legs in no way gets to his essence. If a man loses a leg, is he any less of a man? Aristotle says no. And so it's one of the foundations for equal rights amongst humans. No human is more human than another human. And your rights are based in your humanity. There's no way I can strip you of that. It's somehow essential to you. But it's not as precise. This is very precise. Because it's hard to know, did you get the essence of something? Yeah, it's a... Uh, But that's going to be the case in almost every field. Yeah, right. Unless you're very Right. For most what we call the higher level fields. They can't go through all this work. That's the beauty of the field. There's this trade-off. The trade-off is we're going to talk about more complexity, but if we're going to talk about more complex systems, we have to sacrifice rigor. Otherwise, it's just not feasible. I mean, if you think in a physics aspect of completely talking about something like a water molecule, Talking about the state of every single one of its electrons, every single one, you can't even go to protons and neutrons, you've got to talk about the quarks. And the quarks, how they relate to each other. And between every single, any two particles, there's some sort of interaction, and you have to capture that interaction. If you did some simple physics problem where you had three point-like objects that had masses and the gravitational forces attracting them, talk about that system, or by the time we're talking about water molecule, way more complex. You've got to track all those interactions. And yet, how does a chemist talk about a water molecule when they're trying to be real precise? Yeah. Oops. It's not double bonded. Sorry. All right. That, and that gets at the system that they're after. And that's enough. Because they're going to talk about more complex systems. You know what it means good enough for the situation. You can always take a chemist, assuming that they haven't done, you know, some uh, nuclear physics course, and start hounding them on what exactly each of these things are, and they find out pretty quick that they don't have that deep of an understanding, because they don't need it for what they're doing. Now, it's kind of a, it almost seems a little paradoxical to my intuition. We, we can understand less to talk about more complex systems. <laughs>
Well, this one's not really a definition. It's we're just getting more details. Keep things simple. Close enough. Some notion of yeah, it, it's rigorous enough. Anyways, wind all over the place on that one. Uh, what were we talking about? This relation. Oh, I was giving you an example of one. So here's what it means. This is okay because y was bounded in this context. We're talking about s has no free variables except for the variables that were introduced on the left side of the expression. Those are the only free variables we can have. So over here, the only free variable we were allowed to use is x. <clears throat> okay. And thirdly, S only contains primitive, logical, or defined symbols. Primitive symbols are the symbols introduced in your axioms. Logical symbols, you can always use or, and, implies. It's always valid to use those symbols of logic. Your existential quantifiers, always valid to use those. So you can always use your primitives, your logical symbols, or the symbols that you've previously defined. Those are the valid things that you can use in constructing S. And those are the only things you can use. What kind of symbols, can what kind of symbols can't I use? Yeah, we'll uh, if I wanted to define x circle y is equal to uh, what is it? There's my new definition. Oh, sorry. This is logically equivalent to this thing. Yeah, it's some undefined symbol. Okay. That I can't use that as a definition. Because we haven't seen that symbol before. If I had already defined the symbol, well, then sure, I could use it, depending on what it means. But since we haven't defined it, this is now completely meaningless. So rather than listing all the things we can't use, we say explicitly, here's ones we can use. Any other random, throw some ink at a wall. Whatever comes up, you can't use it. Unless it happen to be one of those symbols. You gonna say something? <laughs> you look like you're on the verge. No. No, proposition valued means it spits out a proposition. It takes in terms, it spits out propositions. It can be any term. Is blue is a perfectly valid predicate. It takes one term. I can throw you in there, spits out false. I can throw Emma's Jack in there, it spits out true. Okay. All right, I think that finishes this one, right? Pretty good on the rules for a relation. Once you get one of them, the rest of them are pretty similar. Oh, I guess I gave some here, some examples. Defining a new relation, here's exactly how we would define this relation. The less than or equals relation, that means x is less than y, or x is equal to y. Notice that x and y, we can use as free variables because they were introduced over here. Less than, that's a primitive symbol, so we're good there. Or, that's a logical symbol, so we're good there. Equals, how can we use equals? Have we defined it before? Nope. Nope. It's also a symbol of logic. <laughs> Just listing out the things. No, think about it. What's the logic that we developed? The full name of the logic that we developed. Like when someone asks you, what course did you take? What do you tell them? The answer is, I took propositional and first order predicate logic with identity. That's the course. Well, that would typically be understood to be part of the course. But like if you're trying to say the name of the course, like, as an actual course, that's the kind of course you would take. Uh, it's natural to put it in the course. I'm just saying, if you went to university and you took the class, that's what it would likely be called, or something to that effect. To differentiate it from like modal logic, or we didn't talk about modal logic, did we? Yeah, it's less precise logic. It's, so it introduces a symbol for uh, 
is necessary and is, oh, uh, what are the two? Sufficient. Was it sufficient and? Accidentally and necessarily, no, that's not what they use. They use probable and necessarily. If it's necessarily the case and it's probably the case, would be one that I don't remember. So it's still, you can use propositional logic when you're developing modal logic. They just try to add a little bit more to try and help you make arguments that aren't, that can't be made so rigorously. So we'd care, right, we'd care more if we were doing more philosophical type arguments. So to enable us to speak as rigorously as we can about some of these concepts, we need more than just propositional logic. Necessity and possibility. Necessity, necessarily and possibly. I, I don't remember if I said those. Anyways, so. In, there's different types of modal logics. I've only ever bothered going through a good chunk of one, and then I was pretty underwhelmed. It sounded a lot cooler than it was. <laughs> uh, yeah, doesn't matter. There are other logics out there. Let's just say that. But the foundation of all those logics is the logic that we've covered. Propositional and first order predicate, and then with identity, that's kind of optional, but for math, there's always identity in there. Okay, another one. Here's a perfectly valid one. T of x, y, and z is logically equivalent to x minus y is less than x minus z. Okay, what's that one saying? Intuitively, I think that one's saying x is less than the average of y and z. So this is... Uh, this is less than the average of that and that relation. How am I getting that? The way I'm seeing it is we could simplify this to x less than uh, z plus y divided by 2. z plus y divided by 2 is our average. x is less than that. We could simplify it to that. But, sorry, it doesn't really matter what it is saying. This is a perfectly valid definition. Maybe that relation would be a useful relation for some theory that you were developing. I want you as a programmer to write me a function, and here's what my function needs to do. It needs to make sure that the first number is always less than the average of the next two. I want to return true if it is, false if it's not you could return that expression, and that would do it. That's why I was curious if the component Well, this is logically equivalent to this. x is less than z plus y over 2. z plus y over 2 is the definition of the average of, y, of z and y. So this is saying x is less than the average of z and y. So that's exactly what I'm saying. No, this would be true. This would be true if x was less than the average of z and y. This would be false if x was equal to or greater than the average of z and y. <laughs> Should we do concrete numbers? Not that much. Okay. All right. Next. So we can define new relations or predicates. We can define new operation symbols. Some new operation, O, which takes x1, x2, dot, 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 xn, and now an operation, it spits out a term. It takes terms and it spits out terms. Yes. Predicates took terms and spit out propositions, true or false. This operation takes terms and spits out terms. Okay, so some new operation, O, taking the variables x1, x2, dot, 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 xn equal to w, is logically equivalent to S. So this definition is well defined if and only if these conditions are met. First off, same thing. X1, X2, dot, 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 Xn all have to be different variables. Can't pass the same variable twice in two different locations. 
Number two, again, s has no free variables except for the variables that you pass in. So again, same as above. Three, s only contains primitive, logical, or defined symbols. Same as above. Why w can be a free variable over here? Yeah. Uh, yes. Going back to this exact symbol. Let me change the variables here so that they match up over there. x1 minus x2 is equal to w if and only if x1 is equal to x2 plus w. Here's our s. Notice all the variables are free. Here's our new operation symbol taking two symbols, calling it equal to that. To really follow the notation, I guess I could have written it like this. To really follow the notation, we're saying minus applying to x1 comma x2 equals w, or in other words, x1 minus x2 equals w, is logically equivalent to, and then doing it the way we have right there, x1 is equal to x2 plus w. Because then it's not a two place, it's not an operator taking two things. So you're saying subtract the same number from itself, but then it's a single place operator. And it's just subtracting something from itself. It's a function that only needs to take one term. If I say f of x is equal to the function x minus x, that's perfectly valid, but it's a single variable function. It doesn't make sense for me to go x comma x equals x minus x. Now that's a single variable function. Now I could pass in the same number for two different variables. If I have x comma y is equal to x minus y, it's perfectly valid for me to pass in two to, for both my x and my y. That's valid. They're distinct variables because they have distinct symbols. If I do something like this, f of x comma x is equal to x minus x, I can't pass in a 1 for this x and a 2 for this x. This says replace all your x's with a 1. Okay, so that's a 1, that's a 1. This says now replace all your x's with a 2. I just replace them with 1's. How do I plug in 1 and 2 to this expression? I say, well, this x goes to that one, because why not, and this x goes to that one? No, if you're trying to say that, you use different symbols. That's why. I said it with functions, but same thing with all these. Go ahead. We define subtraction in terms of addition, yes. Sure. And so, like, the primitive aren't, like, they each decided that those are the primitive, and that these ones are the definition. Yes. There are logically equivalent systems that pick different primitives to develop the field. One, with arithmetic, it's pretty standard, but one where people start in all sorts of different places is geometry. Geometry is a field where there's quite a few different axiomatic systems that people choose to use, and they have very different primitives. Uh, I wish I could remember any of the other ones off the top of my head. I only am familiar with Hilbert's. And in Hilbert's, his undefined terms are point, line, plane. But no, there are geometries where some of those things are defined rather than primitives. And I can't think of any off the top of my head, but yeah, they're logically equivalent. You still prove the exact same theorems. And I tried to give you kind of a sense of that with the proof of, uh, with our definitions. I tried to show you that it's not the exact same thing, but I showed you in one case, I defined subtraction one way and proved the theorem from it. And I tried to show you we could have also defined subtraction this way and proved, a and proved what used to be a definition as a theorem. 
So there's also trade-offs there. Yeah, and it's almost like only reason it can almost be a circular definition because we used to make a circular word say primitive. Right, we pick primitives. We have to pick some primitives. Period. Uh, that that's a big part of it, yeah. We can't define them in terms of anything. And we have to pick our axioms such that they give the meaning we want to those primitives. So while point might not be defined using Hilbert's axioms, but using some other guy's axioms, point is a defined term, the notion that was captured by the axioms from Hilbert's geometry ends up being logically equivalent to the definition that was given over in this other system. So in one system, it's a primitive. In another system, it's defined. And yet in both systems, it's used in completely logically equivalent ways. So the meaning is still given to it through the axioms. And so it's still perfectly meaningful, even though it's undefined in one system. OK. Uh, Number four. And this is one that probably already caught on to when we were talking about why this definition is bad. It has to be the case that you can prove that there is a unique W such that S. So there exists a unique W such that S is derivable from the axioms in previous definitions. You have to be able to demonstrate it. And if you remember when we were proving our theorems, before we defined the symbol, the operation, we first proved that it was unique, and then we defined it. We proved that every number had a unique additive inverse, and then we defined it. We said, and we'll call that additive inverse of x to be negative x. We proved that every number had a unique multiplicative inverse, and we said now we can define a division this way, using that unique multiplicative inverse. I don't remember if we defined a division, did we? I think we did. Should have. If we didn't, here's what division is. We define x divided by y to be x times y inverse. Oh, yeah, you could just look at what we did. Of course, we erase some of it. Oh, x over y? Yeah. Yeah, no one ever actually uses that division symbol when you get to higher mass. Yeah. Uh, so that you don't confuse elementary school kids. Because there's a rational number, and then there's a the concept of division. And while rational numbers are defined in terms of the same thing as division, in terms of this, you, early on you don't really want to conflate those two concepts. That's a guess. I honestly have no clue. We understand a half a pizza pretty well. Seems like it's easier for them to understand a half than it is to understand yeah. one divided by two. Yeah. Right, that's why I was saying. So keep the concept separate until they're able to see it's one and the same. Just a guess. And I don't think it's a guess that it's that way for education. I'm guessing since it, since that's intuitive, I'm guessing it evolved naturally that way. The two concepts develop and then came together. But I have no idea. Uh, what's that? Yeah. Well, I, I thought the question was, why don't we always just write division as x over y and say x divided by y? That's right. Just notation. Uh, okay. Number four. So, give an example of it here. Before I can define x1 minus x2 equals w, if and only if x1 is equal to x2 plus w, I have to prove that there's a unique, over here, I have to prove that there's a unique w that makes this true. I have to show, for any two numbers, Pick any two numbers you want. 
I say 2 is equal to, we'll say 17 is equal to 5 plus W as a concrete case. I have to prove that for any two numbers, there's always one and only one number that you can plug in here to make this true before I'm going to define subtraction in terms of that. Why? If there were more than one W here, then when I, when I asked you, what's 17 minus 5? Then spitting out multiple answers, it's no longer well defined. Because then what you're going to get to is if in one case it can be 3, and, if, and in another case it can be 5, then I can now prove 3 equals 5. Just like our example from before. Wonderful. So yeah, we have to prove that there's a unique W satisfying S before we can use it to define a new operation. It does capture criterion and non-creativity. In particular, it also it protects us from creating uh, contradictions. Okay, next constants. How do we define constants? The constant w is e or c, c is our new constant we're defining, equal to w is logically equivalent to s, is well defined if and only if w is the only free variable in s. Remember, c is a constant, so it can't be a free variable. It's a constant. It's not a variable. Yeah. Okay, so that's why it can't be a free variable in s, because the constant can't be a variable. All right, so w can be the only free variable in s. All right, so W is the only free variable in S, too. S only contains primitives, logical, and defined symbols. That's the same as before. And three, there's a unique W such that S. The constant has to name one and only one thing. I can't pick a constant like Jeremy and have that reference five people. Otherwise, Jeremy doesn't name Jeremy. It names multiple people. It has to be a unique identifier. Otherwise, it's not constant. One is one and only one number. That was a bad example. <laughs> two is one and only one number. There can't be two things that are two. <laughs> 17 is one and only one number. <laughs> okay, so constant has to name one and only one thing. So there has to be a unique W such that S is satisfied. So we defined 2 plus 2, or we defined 2. Here's the long way of saying it, using following the pattern here. I say, oh, I think I used it as an example here. 2 is equal to w if and only if w is equal to 1 plus 1. So the only way I can define 1 plus 1 to be 2 is if I prove that 1 plus 1 is one and only one number. Okay. Uh, okay, next is just no. No, we may use the equal signs for our definitions with operations and constants as well. We don't always have to use logically equivalent. We can use equal signs to define these things. So rather than saying x minus x1 minus x2 equals w as a definition for subtraction, using, let me give you another definition of subtraction using an equal sign. Here's another way we could define subtraction, and it's the way I prefer to define subtraction. I define, sir, please be better. I define x minus y colon equals, letting us know I'm defining with an equal sign, and I like to define it as x plus y's additive inverse. That's the definition I prefer for subtraction. And we proved that as a theorem over there rather than as a definition. So we use this as our definition and then prove this as a theorem. I prefer to start with this as a definition and prove this as a theorem. Similarly with how I said I prefer to define division up here. I prefer to find x divided by y as x times y's multiplicative inverse. So operation symbols you can define with an equal sign. Constants you can also define with an equal sign. Rather than going through all this mess, 2 is logically equivalent, or 2 equals w if and only if w is equal to 1 plus 1, we just say 2 is equal to 1 plus 1. That's what we define 2 to be. 
Much simpler. So we can do that for constants. We can do that for operator symbols. We cannot do that for relations. What? Relations, you always have to define using this notation. Uh, there's just no way to do it with a relation because... Well, it, it's spitting out something that's uh, true or false. Uh, give you an example of a common relation that you're used to. Uh, when we say, let's let's not do that one. Let's do uh, where's one that we already have written here, so I can avoid writing. Oh, let's use this example right here. X is less than or equal to y is logically equivalent to x is less than y or x is equal to y. Since I'm defining a new relation, then this thing has to be either true or false. So the thing over here either has to be true or false. And this is saying they have the same true or false value. Okay. So that's intuitively how I see it. But then you could just try to think, I'm trying to say that this is equal to true when this is equal to true, and this is equal to false when this is equal to false. So it's like I need to use two equal signs to create that definition. Or I could just use this symbol. Because how, how do you use two equal signs in one definition? It just doesn't work. So relations we always define with logically equivalent. As a general rule, we typically define new operations and new constants with equal signs rather than logically equivalent. But we can always and forever use logical equivalents. We never have to use equals. It's just far more convenient. And so you can have a perfectly complete theory of definition uh, with just propositional and first order predicate logic. We didn't need to include identity, but it's nice. Okay. Maybe you do need to include identity. I might have just liked you. But we don't have to use identity in these definitions. We do have to use identity when we define a new operation symbol. An operator has to be equal to something. So maybe you can't have a complete theory of definition without identity. Now I'm not sure. Hmm. Can't tell you one way or another. Okay. Uh, and I think that finishes it for theory of definition. The author then goes into some big explanation of why. Division by zero is undefined. And he tries to give some really wacko suggestions for ways that we could define it that are all terrible. It's one of the places where the author is really showing uh, where he doesn't have a lot of expertise. He, the, the textbook is written for a philosophy class, not a math class. That's okay. So you can read what he says. Ultimately, we can't divide by zero. We already had that conversation last time at the end of class. We made it a quick conversation. So we won't bother with that again here. But can't divide by zero. That's what he spends a good chunk of the remainder of the chapter talking about. So what's next? So next is set theory. Well, before we move on. Go ahead. Sure. The rules of derivation, what we talked about, versus the uh, criterion of definition, what makes an entity an entity uh, What would be the least likely that we'd need a reference again? Probably these criterions actually written out. Huh? Maybe I'll just move to chalkboard. I'm sick of these markers dying on me. Uh, I thought that you guys could see it okay even when I hit a dead spot. I think it's just annoying for me to write on. And I think it actually shows up okay. So, just thinking about you guys, what works for you, even though it's awful to write on. Give, give, give. All right. Let's see. Uh, put my squiggly. Roughly here, and we should be good. And just kind of write out what we need as we go. 
Okay, so quick recap on all of it. First thing we talked about was propositional logic. Maybe just proposition logic. Okay. So what were the major things of propositional logic? Yeah. Yeah, so we had our notion of what a proposition is. Something that's true or false. What else did we have? We have uh your basic two tables, so you have and or not. So what do we call those things? Logical operators, that works. Or Boolean operators is another way that it's often said. No, this is just propositional logic. Nope. That's in predicate logic. What else is there? Are there any rules of derivation? Our rules of derivation. So what were our rules that we had? No, but we had some of them. Yeah, so we had rule P. We can introduce a premise at any point. Uh, it's, I accidentally kept calling it conditional premise. It's called conditional proof. It enables you to eliminate a premise. Yeah. So can the, the rule of conditional proof, yep. Um, and then we're missing. We can, we, can, we can use what we call our, so these are actually, these are our rules of uh, logical inference. These are our rules for deductive reasoning. Rule T is we can use our rules of logic. Your rules of logic are the things you prove are tautologies. So a rule of logic is not alpha or beta is logically equivalent to not alpha and not beta. This is a rule of logic. These are our rules of logical inference, or our rules of deductive reasoning. Okay, so we're talking about those. Rule T says we can use all our rules of logic. If you prove this formula is logically equivalent to that, you can always replace this with that and that with this and go back and forth between them. So it's our rule that says we can use all our tautologies. So rule T, we can use all our tautologies. And then we had, as a secondary rule, rule reductio ad absurdum. This is a secondary rule because you can derive it from these rules. You don't need it as a separate rule. It's just we use it so much it was nice to have it as its own separate rule because of its usefulness. Okay, and that's what we did with propositional logic. Then we came to predicate logic. And what did we do in predicate logic? First off, we had the notion of a predicate. What's a predicate? Uh, prop valued Hmm. No. No, you're used to, we create set theoretical notions of these things. So there's a notion of a function, and then there's a set theoretical notion of a function. And the set theoretical notion of a function is a function. And in all deeper levels of mathematics, since every field of mathematics presupposes set theory, we have access to a set theoretical notion of a function. Same with the set theoretical notion of an operation, set theoretical notion of a... Yeah, we define all those things in set theory after we define them logically. We use them logically. Weird. I heard that you would have a different definition of a function that works in both ways. Uh, kind of. We'll, we'll see that in set theory. We define what it means for two sets to be equal, and yet equality is a notion of logic. Yeah. And we'll get to that. And it's really not that... Sh Strange. We're just saying there's a logical notion, and now we have this other way that we want to say sets are equal. We can give it to you really quick. We know in set theory that order doesn't matter. So the set AB 
is equal to the set BA. We want to say that this is the case, right? But logically speaking, this is not equal to that. Those symbols are in different orders. All I know from logic is that AB is equal to AB. Okay, that's a consequence of logic. I have the same thing on both sides. And I can't just go around swapping the orders of things. I expect it to still be equal. Otherwise, this would be equal to this. I just flip the order of some symbols. What's the big deal? Well, sometimes it's a big deal, sometimes it's not. So we have to give a set theoretical notion of set equality so that we can capture this. And it won't violate our notion of equality for logic. But it gives us a way of talking about sets being equal that we want to use for sets being equal. So it doesn't violate anything, but just gives us a set theoretical notion of equality. So nothing weird about it. Uh, so predicates, we introduce predicates with their proposition valued functions. They're things that take in terms and spit out true or false. Take in terms, spit out a proposition. We also have terms. This is where we introduce actual terms. Terms. Okay, terms. So you have variables and constants. Constants. And then I'm going to put operators. But operators meaning operators with their necessarily with a sufficient number of terms and constants. So this is a term. Okay, there's a term. Kind of a messy one, but still term. So that's terms. Either constants or variables or, co or combinations of constants or variables with operators. Operators are how you can glue constants and variables together. Because an operator just takes terms and spits out terms. So when you evaluate it when it's all said and done, you just have one term. Okay, so terms. I guess we could put as another one here, operators. Probably should have put that before terms. Because we use that to construct terms. Okay, what else? Quantifiers. The existential quantifier and the universal quantifier. And then with it, we also had new rules. Five, we had our new rules, and those rules were universal specification, universal generalization, existential specification, and existential generalization. And let's see, do we have anything else in predicate logic? I think we're good, right? Yeah. Better if I prepare these things ahead of time. So I have time to think about. And then finally, we introduced identity. And what did we introduce with identity? We introduce the actual equal symbol with identity. And rule-wise, we introduce our rule, I, of identity. And what did the rule of identity enable us to do? We have two high-level ways of saying it. It says everything's equal to itself. Everything's identical with itself. That's a high-level way it said. And then the second way it said is equals may be substituted for equals. And that captures rule I. Okay, and I think with that, that covers all the major notions of logic. And then, and then we got to theory of definition after that. Yeah, for relations, for you can think about the top one as predicates. So that tells us how to define predicates, how to define operations, and how to define constants. Which is what we're talking about here. So how to define these things, how to define these things, and how to define some of these things. You don't define a variable. I said you don't. 
you never define a variable. A variable is a placeholder for something, not like not a defined thing. Sure, you have ideas of lots of things that aren't defined. We never define that symbol. So, okay, so that was a quick recap of all that. Go ahead. Oh, an axiomatic system. So, the major thing that we use logic for is to construct axiomatic systems. Uh, we were trying to introduce examples of axiomatic systems as soon as we could. I think our first example was introduced with predicate logic. I don't think we had an example of one with just propositional logic. Yeah, I'm not even sure what that would look like. So we had, with this, we have a notion of an axiomatic systems. And what does an axiomatic system have as its axioms, as its definitions, it has its theorems, the things we prove, and then as its primitives. And so every system of mathematics is an axiomatic system or some combination of axiomatic systems. And so now we're going to jump into the most basic mathematical axiomatic system, the axiomatic system for set theory. So we'll do a rigorous development of set theory. We're actually going to introduce the axioms and go through it. Uh, for the rest of today, let's just do a, a feel-good introduction to set theory high level, kind of a naive set theory. And then next time we'll do deep dive. So speaking high level, what is a set? Strictly speaking, a set's undefined. But now we're talking to someone who's never heard of a set before. How do we explain to them what a set is? A unique, unordered collection of objects that doesn't occur. A unique, unordered collection is a pretty standard way of saying it. So we put the curly brace there. That starts it. And then we can put anything in a set that we want. I can put the number one in there. I can put a circle in there. I can put a square in here. I can put SpongeBob in here. I can put a house in here. Well, we don't worry about that because I can't recursively draw. So we'll keep really high level for now. No. Now we're talking about sets. Next time we're going to develop an axiomatic system called set theory. The axiomatic system of sets. But we'll save the axioms for next time. And right now we're just going to talk about high level what these things are and get comfortable with them. And you already know set from programming, exactly that. Set where what can it store? Anything. So no restriction on it. Now you could have a set of integers, which is a set where everything's integers, blah, blah, blah. But set. Uh, unique, unordered collection of objects. So what do we mean by that? We mean by that that 1, 2, 2, 2 is the exact same set as the set 2, 1. Duplicates don't matter in a set. This is set 1, 2, 2, 2. What are all the objects in this set? 1's in there and 2's in there. There's only two things in there. So the size of this set is 2. The number of objects in this set is 2. The number of objects in this set is 2. Everything that's in this set is in this set. Everything that's in this set is in this set. These two sets are equal. That's how we think about two sets being equal. Right? How many objects are in that set? 2. How many objects are in that set? Three? You're counting one twice. No, we're not. 
This is one, this is two, this is a secotaining one. Those are all very different things. There's three objects in this set. Okay, notation. When you want to say something is in the set, so if I say A is equal to this set, so A is this set, if I want to say one is in A, the way I symbolize that is one is in A, or one is a member of A. So our two undefined terms when we develop set theory are going to be set and this symbol. This is a, is a member of symbol. One is a member of A if A is equal to this set. Two is a member of A. And the set containing one is a member of A. Those are the three things in A. We're saying one is a member of the set containing one. And then what? Is a member of A. I'm not sure where I'm writing that. You're saying right here? Yeah. No, because this right here, first off, you're applying relations back to back, so you need parentheses somewhere. So you want to speak about it strictly. So are you talking about this? Or are you talking about put the parentheses there? Either way, you're in trouble. It doesn't. Right, one is a member of one. That's true. True is a member of A. I mean, I guess A could contain Boolean, so it could still make sense. You're asking, does A contain true? Well, does your, what do you, what do you, is there any of that in fact that's one? That we call one. Uh, I usually read it as in. I know, but you talk about the symbol itself. Doesn't you can call it epsilon, or the is a member of symbol. Is this an operator? It's a relation. Relation. Returns true or false. So 1 is in A is true. 3 is in A is false. Make sense? Okay. Now defining the uh, basic set operators. And we'll see these again next time. We have the notion of A union B. Uh, this is the set of all X such that, maybe introduce set builder notation here, the set of all X such that X is in A or X is in B. So a good chance to show you what we call set builder notation here. This is a set of all x such that x makes whatever's over here true. So when you use set builder notation, you put your variable on the left-hand side of the colon, and then on the right-hand side of the colon is going to be some expression that given an x evaluates to true or false. If the x makes this thing evaluate to true, then x is in the set. If the x makes it evaluate to false, x is not in the set. Let's give a really concrete example. I say that A is equal to the set 1, 2, 3. I hate doing threes and squigglies. 3, squiggly. And B is equal to the set 3, 4, 5. Okay, so then A union B is equal to the set. Sorry, colon equals that set. That's what we define it to be. This is an operator, so it takes two sets. Maybe don't get confused by that underline either. I'm just saying define that new thing. A, upside down U, B, this is read as A union B. This is a set operator, so it takes two sets and spits out a set. What, does a set sp what set does it spit out? It spits out all the X such that X is in A or X is in B. So let's write that concrete. A union B is equal to the set of all X where X makes this true. What are all the x's that make that true? Is 1 in A? Here's my concrete A, here's my concrete B. A is 1, 2, 3, B is 3, 4, 5. So I'm wondering, is 1 in A union B? So is 1 in A? Yes, so that's true. Is 1 in B? No, so that's false. True or false is true. So 1 makes it true, so 1 is in there. What about one half? Is one half in A? No. 
Is one half in B? No. Fault or fault is false. So one half's not in there. SpongeBob's not in there. Fire hydrant's not in there. What are the things that are in A union B? One, two, one, two three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Those are the only elements that make this true or this true. So A union B is everything that's in A or B. We think about it as the or for sets. That's one way that we often think about union. We'll get to specifying a domain. But we specify domains with sets. And so we're in a bit of a catch there. That's kind of like, that to me sounds like whether it's intuitively just a question. It was just for, right, for right now, for the sake of introducing feel good set theory, we'll say x can be anything. Well, it can be what you're asking is exactly the Right. But we can test anything we want. So we can test brick, fire hydrant, the sun, throw anything in there you want and evaluate it. OK, so there's union. Now intersection. Intersection is like the anding of sets. So A intersect B, we define that to be the set of all x such that x is in A and x is in B. So again, if A was equal to the set, 1, 2, 3, and B was equal to the set, what did we have last time? 3, 4, 5? Yeah. 3, 4, 5. Then A intersect B is equal to what? Three. Just the set containing 3. 3 is the only thing that will make this whole thing true. If I try plugging 1 in there, X is in 1, true. X is in B, or sorry, X is in A, true. X is in B, false. True and false is false. Doesn't work. 3 is the only thing that makes that true and that true. Now we also have uh, pictorial ways of viewing both of these with Venn diagrams. If this was my set A, represent pictorially, there's A. And this was my set B, like that. A union B would be everything that's in A or B. That would be all these elements. However, A intersect B would only be the stuff that's in both. That's just the intersection. That's just this part. That middle part. Keep me scribbling there. That would be the intersection, pictorially speaking. Hopefully my drawing is not too awful. OK, so that's union. That's intersection. What's another common set up set symbol? That's a relation. Let's stick with operators for a second and then switch to relations. The complement. The complement only makes sense when you have a universe, but we can do set subtraction. So we can do A minus B. What is A minus B? This is a set of all X such that. Can you guys see that? X is in A and X is not in B. So you start with the set A and get rid of everything that's in B, and that's where you're left with. You guys can see that? Uh, it just looks awful. Okay. So that's what we mean by A minus B. Take A, get rid of everything in B, that's what you're left with. Pictorially, what does that look like? If this is A and this is B, here's A, here's B, we start with the set A and then get rid of everything that's in B. And what are we left with? We're left with this. That's A minus B. Notice that's very different from B minus A. B minus A would instead be everything over here. So, just like in regular arithmetic, set difference is not commutative. Is there 7 minus 3 is very different from 3 minus 7. Yes, there is a symbol for that. And we call it the symmetric difference. So once you have this difference defined, 
Now we can define the symmetric difference. We use a delta for that. This one's less used, so you don't really need to memorize this one. But A, symmetric difference B, we define that to be A minus B union B minus A. Everything in A that's not in B together with everything that's in B not in A, and that's exactly what we have drawn in here when you include both those. We call that the symmetric difference. That one is commutative. Okay, any other set operations? A very crucial one that we're still missing. Besides the complement. That's the complement one. You get that through the minus though. Come on, you guys. Crucial one. Don't make me write it. Don't make me do this. The times one. Yeah, the cross product between two sets. A cross B. And that is equal to... That one spits out the set of all ordered pairs. It's all x comma y now. In an ordered pair like that, notice instead of x, it's x comma y. We're going to represent it with two variables, where each of those variables have to make the entire condition that we put over here true. So that's where x is in A and y is in B. That's okay. We're doing... Uh, Naive set theory. Introducing you to the big ideas, and then we'll rigorously develop all this. We'll rigorously develop order pair. We'll get there. But most people are comfortable with that from just like looking at points. So let's look at a concrete example of this. This one we can't do nice and pictorially. Well, we kind of can. If we said this line is... That just shattered. If we said this line is a set A, and we said this line is a set B... Then their cross product we can represent as this area right here. That's one way to do it. But that's not very, uh, in some sense, it kind of is. That's not very uh, feel goody. So let's do a discrete example. So if we say A is equal to the set ABC and B is equal to the set 1, 2, I don't want to write nine elements. Then A cross B is equal to the set of all ordered pairs. So we're going to write ordered pairs here. We're going to write parentheses, two things, and parentheses. All ordered pairs of X and Y, such that X is in A and Y is in B. So let's see. We can have little A's in big A and ones in B. Oops. So here's one thing in the set. Notice A and 1, A for X and 1 for Y, satisfies this expression. Is 1 in A? Yes. Or sorry, is little a in big A? Yes. Is 1 in B? Yes. So this order pair is in A cross B. Similarly, we have little a in 2. We have little b in 1. We have little b in 2. We have c in 1. And we have c in 2. And that's everything that we have in the cross product. Those of you from computation theory might remember we use that operation a whole heck of a lot. That is an operator. Wonderful. Good point. <laughs> cardinality is probably off. Cardinality is not an operator. Uh, what would we call it? I guess technically it is an operator. So it gives you the number, and the number is a set. So yes, it takes a set and it spits out a set. <laughs> but most people wouldn't see that. So if A was a set containing 1, 2, and 3, and you said the size of A, then that would be equal to 3. And yeah, that's a unary operator. It took a set and it spat out a set. 
But when we're doing feel goody set theory, we ignore the fact that three is a set. All right, so before we move on to the next operator that Emma talked about, let's talk about a subset and proper subset. Okay, so this is now a relation. These were all operators, they spit out sets. Notice I kept saying it's equal to set, it's equal to set, it's equal to set, da da da. All right, now I'm defining subset. What does it mean for A to be a subset of B? This is now going to be a relation or a predicate. Predicate, relation, same thing. A set predicate, a set relation. It's going to take two sets and spit out true or false. And this is logically equivalent to... Logically equivalent to... For all little a in big A... I'll try it this way so that we don't... Trying to keep it similar to what we have up there. Can you guys see that? For all x, if x is in A, then x is in B. That's what it means for A to be a subset of B. Everything in A is in B. So if I say A is equal to the set 1, 2, and B is equal to the set 1, 2, to little a, is a a subset of b? Yes. yes, everything in a is in b. One's in a, is that in b? Yes. Two's in a, is that in b? Yes. So a is a subset of b. What if I included little a here? So that big A and big B are equal. Is it still the case that a is a subset of b? Yes. Everything in here is still in here. I can't find anything in here that's not in here. Uh, introduce this special symbol. We'll use this a lot in set theory. That's shorthand for the empty set. So this is equal to the empty set. And it might not seem like it saves us much to have that, but if you had to write those squigglies, you'd understand how nice it is to have that. <laughs> Writing those squigglies is really annoying. So it's a wonderful symbol. All right, so with that symbol, Help me out with some things. What is A union the empty set? For any set A, what's A union the empty set? It's just A. This is everything that's in here or in here. Well, there's nothing in here, so it's everything that's in here. What's A intersect the empty set? That one's the empty set. That's everything that's in here and in here, but there's nothing in here. Okay, true or false? The empty set is a subset of A. Yeah, that's always the case. For any set A, the empty set is a subset of it. Everything in here is guaranteed to be in there. It's vacuously true. Is this ever true? A is a subset of the empty set. Can that ever be true? Only if A is the empty set. Otherwise, no, it's not true. Oh, uh, whatever ways can I try and trick you? Let's try this one. A cross the empty set. What does that equal? Just A. Yeah, just A. No, not just A. It's all the ordered pairs where the first element comes from this and the second element comes from this. How many ordered pairs can you make that way? Zero. So it's a set containing no ordered pairs. There it is. And you'll notice that some people kind of think about this one a little bit similar to addition. And this one kind of similar to multiplication. So a plus 0 is just a, and a times 0 is 0. Maybe you like that, maybe you don't. Maybe that helps make it intuitive to you. I don't know.
when you start to look at what is three symbols? So a number is a definition that by three one. So you're saying one way we can think about three. Three is equal to three symbols. Three symbols. Yeah, like um, so. If you thought about it, three has You're saying the number three being the definition of three symbols? I, I don't think I'm following you. Three as the definition of three symbols. Anyone else following this? So let's start with two. See if I can follow you. Two by definition is one plus one. Is that what you're saying? Um, so far, I'm. Yeah, yeah but it, it, it has one and two in that. I don't know. You're saying the set theoretical definition. So going back to set theory, we define zero to be the empty set. Is this what you're talking about? I don't know. <laughs> one is defined to be the set containing zero, which is equal to the empty set, by the way, the set. This is equal to 2 is equal to the set containing 1, 0. This is equal to. Da, 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 da. All right, there's 2. And you might wonder. Why these things? Notice one nice thing about this definition is the cardinality of the set always gets to the quantity you care about. How many things are in this set? Two things. There's that set and that set. How many things are in this set? One thing. Just that set. How many things are in this set? Nothing. And similarly, three is defined to be a set containing one, two, one, and zero. I guess I'll follow my pattern. And now, this is the last one I'm writing. Okay, right, that is going to be there's two. There's one. There's zero. Okay. okay so there's, there's, there's three. three. Did I put comma there? Sorry. Like if you were to break it to three, you using like the class. Oh, there should be a comma. And there's a comma there. But here's your outer set. It starts here, ends here. Okay, so that set, that set, and that set. Thank you. Good catch. Uh, I have to think about it more. Uh, you could definitely do arithmetic with these sets. That's definitely the case because we can construct most of arithmetic from sets. That's the point of going through all this work. It's the point of set theory is to lay foundations for all these things. The two most common fields of mathematics are arithmetic and geometry. <laughs> we're, we're, we're a long ways off from that. We'd have to do addition before we did multiplication. And to do that, we need to come up with a successor function. Uh, we're not going to develop into arithmetic. From set theory. I don't know. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> We're getting to the point where we kind of need to decide what it is we want to do. I was thinking about going and doing Newtonian mechanics because the author does a good amount with that, but then going and pre reading the chapter, I realized that's not feasible. <laughs> uh, one, you need calculus. It is. He was, he was using it as an example of axiomatic systems in other fields of knowledge. So he has a special note that this is used. The teacher doesn't have to use this as an example, but it's here because he thought it was interesting, and for people who could go over it, thought they might want to go over it. And he, the other example that he gives is... Uh, uh, probabilities and statistics like we do in discrete math. He comes out a slightly different way from the way we did, but 
That's the other axiom access to mediums. And we could do that one, but I'm saying big picture, we need to decide where we're going because we can go as far with set theory as we want, and then after set theory, we don't have anything concrete to do. I don't know what you guys want to do. Uh, so maybe we can end this with feel goody stuff, give you a sense of what all this stuff is. Uh, we can start next time with uh, rigorously developing set theory, and then we can just briefly talk without recording about what I should be preparing next. <laughs>